Deuteronomy chapter 2 for our reading. We're going to read verses uh, 1 to 25. If you remember, uh, the book of Deuteronomy is a series of sermons presented by Moses. And he is preparing the second generation of Israelites after the Exodus for their conquest of the land of Canaan. Up to this point, uh, we've heard of uh, the spies that were sent out by the Israelites to check out the land of Canaan, uh, how they responded uh, of the beauty of the land, but also of the, the people that they were meant to conquer. They were a mighty people, and it um, led to the unbelief of the first generation of Israelites. Deuteronomy 2 Beginning in verse 1, we read these words. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea, as the Lord told me. And for many days we traveled around Mount Seir. Then the Lord said to me, You have been traveling around this mountain country long enough. Turn northward and command the people. You are about to pass through the territory of your brother, the people of Esau, who live in Seir. And they will be afraid of you, so be very careful. Do not contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as for the sole of the foot to tread on, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall purchase food from them for money, that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them for money, that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. So we went on, away from our brothers, the people of Esau, who lived in Seir, away from the Arabah road from Elath and Ezion Geber. And we turned and went in the direction of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land for a possession, because I have given Ar to the people of Lot for a possession. The Emim formerly lived there, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they also counted as Rephaim, but the Moabites called them Emim. The Horites also lived in Seir formerly, but the people of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them, and settled in their place, as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave to them. Now, rise up and go over the brook Zered. So we went over the brook Zered, and the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zered was thirty-eight years, until the entire generation, that is, the men of war, had perished from the camp, as the Lord had sworn to them. For indeed, the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the camp until they had perished. So as soon as all the men of war had perished and were dead from among the people, the Lord said to me, Today you are to cross the border of Moab at Ar. And when you approach the territory of the people of Ammon, do not harass them or contend with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the sons of Lot, for a possession. It is also counted as a, a land of Rephaim. Rephaim formerly lived there, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before the Ammonites, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place, as he did for the people of Esau who lived in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites before them and they dispossessed them and settled in their place even to this day. As for the Avim, who lived in villages as far as Gaza, the the Captorim, who came from Captor, destroyed them and settled in their place. Rise up, set out on your journey, and go over the valley of Arnon. Behold, I have given unto your hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to take possession and contend with him in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you on the peoples who are under the whole heaven, who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The Exodus marks the, uh, in a sense, the birth of a nation. Uh, God had set into motion through promises made to Abraham his intent for the descendants of Abraham. But up until this time, they were just a, a, a struggling people living under slavery in Egypt. Now God is calling them out and uh, their identity as the children of God is beginning to take, take shape. They're like a, a, an infant growing. And you know, children often go through growing pains. Well, Israel in this very first generation is going through some severe growing pains. The Lord is teaching them how to live as his covenant people. And because we also are covenant people of God, there are lessons that we can learn from this. As God deals with Israel, well surely, if he's the same God and we are the same people, then he deals with us in a similar fashion. We're gonna look at the lessons learned by the Israelites uh, in the wilderness. And I think it's, it's very fascinating passage of scripture when you carefully start to examine it and look at what the Lord is teaching. Three things that I wanna point out as we move through this section. First, we see that the Lord is long suffering and gracious. We see, secondly, that the Lord is faithful to his promises. And last, as covenant children, the Lord demands obedience to his commands. First of all, the Lord is long-suffering and gracious. It's helpful here to review a little bit of Israel's offensive behavior to a God who had done nothing but good to them. Israel was living in a, uh, a very oppressed position. They really had, they were hopeless, a hopeless people. They were under Egyptian bondage, slaves to Pharaoh, under his thumb, so to speak, and really going nowhere. And then God, through his servant Moses, delivers them through these 10 mighty uh, signs, the, the great plagues that uh, he used to draw them out of Egypt. He does all of these wonderful things to them and their response as they start to face some trials in the wilderness is to forget who their God is. If you look in chapter one, verse 27, you see this. And you see, if you're uh, familiar with the history of the Old Testament Israelites, particularly during the Exodus period, then you know that this type of thinking crops up among them on a regular basis. Chapter 1, verse 27, we read, And you murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Now think about that. Think about the offense that that gives to God. God has just delivered them. So what's he going to do? Does he deliver them just so that he can slaughter them in the wilderness? Has, has God drawn you to Christ so that he can hand you over to the devil? No, it's absurd to think that way. And you can recall times where they are hungry when, when God brings the quail to them, they're murmuring in much the same way. What has God done? We would, they even say to him, we would rather go back and make bricks in Egypt than serve this God anymore. And then there's a time where they are thirsty and they say a similar thing. In spite of God's powerful deliverance from Egypt, they doubt his ability to give them victory over the inhabitants of Canaan. Look back in verses 19 and uh, 28 of chapter one. Then we sent out from Horeb and went throughout, or through all the great and terrifying wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites as the Lord our God commanded us, a great and terrifying wilderness. Well, what was so terrifying about it? 
Chapter 1, verse 28 explains. We are going up. Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. And besides, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Now, I've mentioned to you the, these names, the, uh, the, let's see, in uh, verse 20, the Rephaim, the Zamzumim, the Anakim, these are all a, a race of people that had these giant-like characteristics. Think of Goliath. Uh, they were massive, they were tall, and they were a warrior people. So you can imagine the Israelites were a little bit frightened. But the oddest thing about it all is they had seen God do, perform the ten plagues. He had just taken them out of the land of the most dominant army in the world, Pharaoh's army. And yet they doubted that God could deliver that God could allow them or enable them to dispossess the people of Canaan. They're acting like spoiled children. As we follow this idea that God is training them and developing them as a nation like a child, we see that God brings discipline into the lives of this spoiled nation. Question is this, how is God going to relate to them now? Because we may look at our own walk with the Lord and wonder what happens when we complain against the Lord because our circumstances aren't working the way that they should or that we expected them to. And maybe not all of you have done that, but I'm sure somebody in the room has had moments where they've looked at their life and been very upset with God. One of the most remarkable things we see here is that in the midst of his discipline, he is still very present with them. And this kind of ties into what we've been talking about on Wednesday nights, walking with God in the midst of pain and suffering. Turn over to uh, chapter two, verse seven. We read a remarkable statement after God begins to enact discipline on that first generation. They start to move into the wilderness back towards the Red Sea. We see this statement made. 2.7, for the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. Isn't that remarkable? So you may be going through troubles and difficult, dark, dark times in your life, but don't think that God doesn't know what you're going through. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. That is a powerful statement in Scripture. It is comforting to know you can't think of uh, possibly a darker, more difficult time in the life of the nation than these 40 years wandering and probably feeling as if God was no longer there. That's not true. He knows and he was with them. The source of God's continuing presence with a obstinate and sinful people is Christ. You cannot understand God's dealings with Old Testament Israel if you, if you think the Old Testament teaches some type of a form of religion that's based on law keeping. If you think about it, Israel, if that was the case, if when Moses laid the law out, that was the gauntlet being dropped saying you have to keep the law in order to stay in this relationship with me. If you think very carefully about this, how on earth did they continue after the very first generation of people? Within days of the giving of the law, what had they done? They'd broken the first four commandments through worshiping the golden calf. So if God was operating 
on a pure system of merit, they would be destroyed. They would be removed from his presence like Adam and Eve were. But what does he do after that? He commands Moses to sacrifice animals on behalf of the people. That's Christ. And this theme is picked up in the New Testament as well. There's two pictures that are taken from this uh, point in Israel's history, the wilderness wanderings. Uh, in John chapter 3, Jesus speaks of the serpent being lifted up in the wilderness. And then he says he is the serpent. He makes a clear line between him and that activity in the wilderness. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 5, the Israelites are out in the wilderness and they're, they think that they're dying of thirst. And then Moses hits the rock at Meribah and the rock gushes water and they drink. And Paul says the rock is Christ. So uh, all of these themes tie together. God is long-suffering and gracious. He's, um, I, I used this illustration the last time I preached this, so you're probably familiar with it, but when I was in, in college, I went to Myrtle Beach, California, and spent a summer there with Campus Crusade. They do a summer mission type thing. And I remember sitting on the beach watching this mother, and she had two young children, and they were playing in the surf. And she was, she was just a, um, just constantly on the move, watching over those two little children. They were young, and if you know a wave knocked them down, it could be trouble for them. And it just was a beautiful picture of what chapter two seven reminds me of. God is constantly watching over his people in the midst of their life. And if you think about your, your journey with God, all of the, the missteps that you could have made, all of the wrong paths that you could have gone on, and how he keeps just bringing you back, bringing you back to safety, it's a beautiful picture. So we see that God, even though Israel had acted obstinately, he never turned his back on them. The second point I want to make is this, the Lord is faithful to his promises. And that's the, the, the real issue for the Israelites. There's an odd journey that takes place. And it, it, take your time and kind of read through this uh, at another point if you have opportunity. But it, it, it's a very interesting story. The Israelites were preparing to go into the, the land of Canaan and start to take it over. But they found out who the inhabitants were, these great giant-like people, and these cities, they were supposed to take these cities that were fortified up to the heavens. Not easy to infiltrate. And they wouldn't do it. They acted in fear and in unbelief, and they wouldn't obey the Lord. So what does the Lord do? It's a remarkable teaching here. Israel is told to backtrack. They had come from Egypt. They had crossed the, the Red Sea. They were moving away. Then we read in verse 1 of chapter 2, then we turned and we journeyed into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. That's odd. That's not what they're supposed to be doing. We, are you taking us back to Egypt, Lord? What's happening here? What is on God's agenda? Then they are led through a number of different lands. They are led through Seir, Moab, and Ammon. Why? Usually, from this point of the history on, when they're led into a land, it's for battle. It's for conquest. 
It's to take possession. It's to dispossess the inhabitants, take possess, possession of it as the Lord's. But in this case, this journey seems so pointless. Listen to what God says about each of the inhabitants or the lands that they go in. See here. Look at verse 4. Turn northward and command the people you are about to pass through the territory of your brother, the people of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. So be very careful. Do not contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as for the sole of the foot to tread on. Why go then? Because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. And you remember um, in, in the story of Israel that Jacob and Esau, Jacob stole the birthright of Esau, but Esau still was given a, a, a possession, a land from his father. Then in verse 8, we see them with Moab. And we turned and went in the direction of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land for a possession, because I have given R to the people of Lot for a possession. And you remember in the Old Testament book of Genesis, Lot was a descendant or a relative of Abraham, and the Lord provided land for him. Remember when Lot's flocks and Abraham's flocks couldn't feed so they, Abraham said, Lot, you pick where you want, and you can have that land. And then Abraham took the land of Canaan. And then the similar thing happens with Ammon. God brings them, but not to inhabit the land. So what's the purpose? Israel has taught a powerful lesson during this journey a humiliating lesson in the Lord's faithfulness. This is what God is primarily teaching them. As a little infant nation, He walks them almost like on a, a field trip through these lands to reveal to them that He is faithful to His promises. That they, he's building their confidence and trust in him that they didn't have when they sent the spies out. He's building it in this second generation of Israelites because they are about to go into that land with those mighty warriors and those fortified cities and take control of them. They need great faith, supernatural faith, to do that. Israel is to see in these three nations that they pass through the Lord's faithfulness in practice. Each of these lands were promised, or each of these three nations were promised land by the Lord. The Lord says, You cannot have Esau's land, you cannot have Lot's land, and you cannot have the land of Esau. Amon, because I have promised it to them. Just like he has promised them, the Israelites, the land of Canaan. And the first thing is the Lord means business with his promises. He says, not even a soul of your foot is going to touch that land because I've committed it to these people. And what the Israelites are going to learn, they are the children of God. They are the most prized possession of the Lord on the face of the earth. And yet the, the Gentiles, the non-covenant people, have a greater faith than they do. That's what they're going to learn. That's where the humility is going to come. In verse 6, we see God taking the people through the land of Seir, Seir that He promised to Esau. And there's a, a point that he's making in verse 6. You shall purchase food from them for money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water of them for money that you may drink. Now, why is that significant in the book of Deuteronomy? What's God showing them? 
He's provided food and water for Seir. But if you'll turn to Deuteronomy 28, verse 12, you'll see the lesson the Lord is teaching. Deuteronomy 28, 12, we read this about the children of God. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you shall only go up and not down if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God. So here they are in their disobedience, having to be the tail instead of the head, having to be dependent instead of the source of provision for others, having to buy water and food instead of being the ones offering the water and the food. Then we see the um, evidence that these nations have dispossessed mighty people like the Israelites were so scared of. Uh, turn to uh, verse 10. So we look at the Moabites. The Emim formerly lived there in the, the land that the Moabites had now taken possession of. The Emim formerly lived there, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they are also ca- counted as Rephaim, but the Moabites call them Emim. The Horites also lived in Seir formerly, but the people of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place as Israel did to the land of their possession. So this is the key. There's two passages that say the same thing. This is the key to understanding this journey. God is is showing Israel how he fulfills his promises even in the midst of unsurmountable odds. It's a beautiful picture of the Lord, in a sense, walking with the hand of Israel and saying, look at what I did to a people who are not nearly as close to me as you are. Look, they had the same fear. They had had the same opposition. And I enabled them to dispossess these mighty people. Surely, to the people whom I love dearly, I will do the same. A lesson, a display of His faithfulness. The last thing I want you to see here is that the Lord demands obedience to His commands. We see in verse 14 the sad ending to the first generation of men who were uh, warriors, soldiers in Israel. Verse 14 says, And the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zered was 38 years, until the entire generation, that is, the men of war, had perished from the camp, as the Lord had sworn to them. For indeed, the hand of the Lord was against, the, against them to destroy them from the camp until they had perished. So that second generation had experienced the Lord's faithfulness to these three lands and the Lord's seriousness about obedience and how their own fathers were dealt with. He brought discipline to them. Now, we tend to look at Old Testament passages like this and think, well, God, you know, that they were in hell or something like that. They were no longer recipients of His grace. That's not true. Moses also never saw the promised land. But Moses, we know from New Testament passages, is in the kingdom of God. So we cannot necessarily say that all of them were uh, left, but we also know in the New Testament that there was unbelief in Israel and that caused them uh, to lose their eternal inheritance. So we need to be careful that we don't uh, read these passages without some nuance in our understanding of them. God takes sin 
and particularly the sin of unbelief, very seriously. His mercy is not a weak mercy. And we need that as a warning not to test it. He brings discipline to the church in the New Testament as much as he did to his covenant children in the Old Testament. Uh, The book of 1 Corinthians dealing with the um, practice of the Lord's Supper. People who were not taking part of it in a way that was worthy of the Lord, they were brought down with sickness and some of them even death. So we, we don't like to talk about those passages or that aspect of God's dealings, but the Bible does, makes it painfully clear that God expects us to be vigilant in following Him. He is merciful, but we can never use mercy or His grace as an excuse to sin. What's the purpose of the discipline? Well, if you turn to chapter 8, verse 2. We get an explanation. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And we see, we will see as we continue to move through Deuteronomy, that the Lord's discipline was very effective over that second generation. You consider under the leadership of Joshua, you read what that second generation of people did who had this training in the wilderness. It is a remarkable example of how we are to live as the children of God. This nation is like a growing child. And just as we discipline our own children, we expect it to lead to change in behavior. And that certainly occurs with our God. And this is how Christ deals with us in salvation. He is gracious and merciful, but he, is also, uh, he also desires sanctification. It's not about easy grace, but it's about a transformation. And as we come to the supper tonight, that's why we come. We come because we want to be more like Christ. We want to know more of his grace in our lives. We want to know, we want to experience more of the resurrection power that leads to new life in us. Where do we find that? We don't find it in ourselves. We come and we feast and we're nourished by the Son of God Himself. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come to you tonight. We ask for you to instruct our hearts with your word. We thank you, Lord, for the lessons we see Israel learning in the wilderness. And we pray that just as you deal with their weak faith and strengthen it, you would deal with our weak faith tonight and strengthen it through the means that you have provided. We pray, Lord, that you would uplift us and help us to know who we are in Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen.